everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Utilizing Non-Invasive Blood Flow Velocity Measurements for Cardiovascular Phenotyping in Small Animals. This is Martin Hess from Inside Scientific, and I will be your host for today's event. We are looking forward to an exciting session today sponsored by Indus Instruments that will focus on using non-invasive blood flow velocity measurements to quantify changes in hemodynamics and characterize cardiac disease without the need for complex surgery or imaging. Our speaker for today's webinar is Dr. Enil Reddy, Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Since 1997, Dr. Reddy has been developing Doppler and physiological signal acquisition and processing systems in collaboration with Indus Instruments, many of which are currently being used in his lab. Dr. Reddy's research interests include evaluation of cardiac and vascular mechanics in senescent, diseased, transgenic, and surgical models of mice. Using non-invasive methods in his lab, he phenotypes animals as abnormal, abnormalities develop and progress, and monitors the cardiovascular system as it adapts and compensates for deterioration of function or for missing or overexpressed proteins. The main goal in his laboratory is to translate what is learned in mice to humans for early detection and screening of vascular diseases. I would like to welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for your interest to learn about the non-invasive uh, cardiovascular phenotyping in small animals. Um, but uh, I can, uh, as Martin mentioned, that a lot of uh, you are interested in larger animals as well. In terms of applications that would be applicable to all other animals as well, but the, the methodologies are slightly different. But I'll be focusing mainly on the non-invasive aspects um, in smaller animals and rodents. And uh, later on I can answer some other questions that you may have for larger animals. Um, I'll be, this is the brief outline of the presentations. I'll uh, talk briefly about the pulse Doppler technology, how it works, just to see and uh, uh, give you some comparisons. And then uh, I'll go into the applications. And uh, this will be in two parts. Uh, I'll do a part one on cardiac function and aortic stiffness and uh, then take a break and then part two will be pressure overload, coronary flow reserve and uh, peripheral vascular uh, function briefly. All right, uh, let's move on. Um, and uh, we all know that uh, rodents are the animals of choice in basic research. Um, these animals, specifically mice, uh, they go undergo genetic and other manipulations like surgical man manipulations that may alter their cardiovascular function. So to study the resulting conditions, we need phenotyping. Since most uh, cardiovascular measurements and parameters are functions of time, we need waveforms. But the challenge is to be non-invasive so that we can do uh, longitudinal studies in these animals. And uh, the next slide shows the, how does the doctor work. And, um, it's very uh, simplistic view of that is that you place a probe on the skin of the animal with some coupling gel and that sends out a, a, a sound beam into the vessel of interest. Now it sends out a pulse and the pulse uh, intercepts uh, the tissues as it travels along and echoes are returned back to the probe but we can select from where we want to listen uh, the echoes from. So uh, by changing the range, we can listen somewhere here, if you are uh, ranging here, or further down. So we can have the control of listening to the echoes from a given location on the vessel. And then this is sent into the system to be processed uh, before the next pulse is sent out. And so a series of this done in very high frequency uh, are processed and displayed on the screen as a flow velocity spectrum. And that flow velocity is in frequency or hertz 
and it's converted into velocity using this formula and that's that conversion is shown on the right so the uh, use usability of pulse doppler ultrasound it's very clearly it's non-invasive so longitudinal studies are uh, possible um, for this we need to have knowledge of the anatomy of the cardiovascular system as you will see further as I go through the slides that uh, it becomes obvious to you why that's important and uh, the shapes of the waveforms obtained from several locations are very distinct so it is possible to recognize these waveforms as you're trying to get the signals uh, because of the probe size, as you will see again um, in the next few slides, uh, it's possible to achieve small angles um, and that means fewer errors in estimating velocity. We can measure at various locations um, on the cardiovascular system and uh, the signal acquisition times are very short. Uh, we can also measure two signals uh, from two different sites uh, simultaneously and combine them uh, and this is especially useful uh, to measure pulse wave velocity uh, uh, which is an indicator of aortic stiffness studies. Now uh, I just wanted to make a point that it's not same as laser Doppler measurement. Laser Doppler measurement is used uh, super on superficial perfusion like skin perfusion or something with a tissue that's uh, within one or two millimeters uh, from the from the probe site. Uh, however, the Doppler goes much deeper than that. Doppler ultrasound, I should say. Um, how do the technologies compare? And I've uh, heard this from a lot of people. Also, we have echocardiography. Uh, you know, uh, how different is it? And so this slide pres shows that is both are non-invasive me me methods. Uh, pulse Doppler mainly measures flow velocity. Echocardiography measures mainly dimensions, and they also it also measures flow velocity, but with the flow velocity is angle correction with angle correction, and that's the key. Angle correction at larger angles can be erroneous if not done properly. So keeping that in mind, uh, we move on to the next one. This pulse Doppler is a small footprint. The system, it's a large footprint of the system. It's a big system. So probes, as you can see in the background here, is very thin. Uh, and uh, the probes here are larger. Um, and these are difficult to get the smaller angles, especially uh, in uh, when aligning, trying to align with the flow. So that's why the flow uh, angle correction has to be used. It's easy to measure from peripheral vessels. Peripheral vessels in echocardiography can be challenging. Um, signal acquisition is fast and it's obviously slower because now you're trying to measure dimensions and things as well, imaging. Um, cost is relatively low and its cost is very high in the case of echocardiography system. Uh, you may also have a question, why not measure volume flow? And here are some of the differences. Pulse Doppler is non-invasive, uh, volume flow is invasive, that means you have to put uh, cuff, cuff probes extravascularly, surgery is involved. Uh, the difference is that Pulse Doppler measures the velocity of flow, whereas Trans, uh, the, in the case of transit time flow, you measure volume flow. Uh, again, small footprint here. Uh, this also has small footprint um, in terms of the probe size, uh, I mean the, in, in terms of the system, and small probes here and small probes here, but they are, again, as I said, they are ex extravascular. Peripheral vessels are easy, not that easy because now again you have to perform surgery and the probes can be large to place around uh, the vessel. Signal, signal acquisition is fast. Here also it is fast after the surgery and the costs are comparable. We can do multiple 
uh, from uh, sites each time. Uh, by that I mean that you can measure from uh, at one site, move on to the next site and to a third site uh, in quick succession. Here it's difficult to do that because you need surgeries at all those locations and this may be limited to one or two sites. Uh, so those are some of the comparisons um, between the two systems. So what can we do with pulse dopplers? Very simply to reiterate uh, the previous, uh, the first uh, slide that I showed, uh, I can do cardiac systolic and diastolic function, you can do study pressure overload models, uh, you can determine coronary flow reserve, so myocardial perfusion uh, in uh, various situations or disease conditions. Um, we can measure aortic stiffness, um, can look at peripheral vascular disease or uh, peripheral vascular function uh, in ischemic models, sign limb ischemia or any other type of studies. Uh, there is one other application that I'll briefly talk about is the tail cuff uh, towards the end. The key thing is to be non-invasive and because of small size of the animals we need high spatial resolution and because of higher heart rates we need high temporal resolution. So now uh, there will be questions as to why blood velocity, you know, what will it give us or how there, there should be a reason for that and this brings us to this uh, scaling aspects. We all know that scaling in mammals from elephants to mice is defined by this equation where the parameters are related to the body weight of the animal. And except when you move down further, arterial pressure, velocities, blood velocities and pulse wave velocities are independent of body size. And so when you make measurements of velocities, which is non-invasive, we can compare this directly across uh, rodents, large animals and to humans. And as you can see, what we see is 100 centimeters per second of aortic velocity in mice is very similar to the same thing in people. So you see 100 centimeters per second aortic velocity in mice, 100 centimeters up approximately in people or any other animals in between with a few exceptions here and there. Similarly, pulse wave velocity is the same thing. So, and that's pretty much uh, gives you uh, a good chance to compare uh, in translational studies. Here is the uh, setup for Doppler system and as you can, as I mentioned before, as you can see, it's a small footprint, fits on a small table and it can be easily moved from one location to other. This is the setting in a lab. Here is the Doppler's part of the Doppler system. The mouse placed on a board with anesthesia and a probe placed right at the xephoid and aimed towards the aortic outflow to get that. And then you capture the signal and analyze the signal. Now I wanted to quickly mention about the mouse board. Uh, with this board we can maintain anesthesia and monitor ECG respiration and body temperature as well. We can maintain the board temperature to control the body temperature or maintain the body temperature of the animal. And with this we can perform non-invasive measurements or invasive measurements and perform surgery, uh, surgical procedures as well. So it's a good uh, system to have and it is an integral part of the Doppler system. Moving on, we will start the applications and uh, I would like to start off with the cardiac Doppler measurements. And I put up this slide uh, basically to show you the timing information and why it's very important. Here we are, we oriented the probe such that it will capture part of each of the signals. This is aortic outflow coming out of the aorta with the ejection and this is the mitral inflow and this is the diastolic, systolic and diastolic phase of the mouse. So here you have the, the depolarization that starts off with the R peak and you got isovolumic 
contraction time and when the pressure in the ventricle exceeds the pressure in the aorta, you get ejection. And then as the pressure in the ventricle drops below aorta, you get aortic valve closure. This is the relaxation, isovolumic relaxation phase. And as the pressure further drops further in the ventricle, you get mitral valve opening, uh, mitral valve opens, and then you get the early flow, passive early flow into the uh, left ventricle. And a little bit later, you get a little P wave that's atrial uh, contract, then which is followed by atrial contraction and the remaining blood in the atria is squeezed out into the ventricle and then the cardiac cycle starts again and when the heart is uh, depolarizes again and starts to contract mitral valve closure occurs and then the cycle repeats so this gives you a good idea of what, what how the cardiac cycle works and the magnitude and shapes of the both inflow uh, inflow and outflow or aortic flow is called outflow and mitral valve inflow um, in mice are very identical to that in humans and for those of you who have seen human data uh, you will see that uh, these look very similar. In fact if I took out the timing on this you wouldn't be able to tell whether it's mouse or human data. So. Typically, that was uh, the case where we show both signals, but when we are making measurements, we orient the probe towards the aorta so that you don't see any other mitral signal or any other signal, and mainly focuses on the aorta so that you can get maximum velocity. The probe can be oriented such that the angle is minimal, and it's given the small size, we can do that um, uh, very easily in our system. So we're placing the sample volumes, essentially we're moving our range gate to uh, range into the ascending aorta or the root of the aorta where you can see the valve clicks as well. And uh, what can we do with uh, a velocity signal like this? This is an indicator uh, of cardiac output. It's a crude indicator of cardiac output. We can compare across uh, several strains of mice and uh, here is, is uh, data from young mice 93 centimeters per second so very close to 100 and that's similar to what we would see in people. With age this starts to deteriorate your cardiac output because that means the systolic function the heart starts to stiffen up a little bit and decrease in contractility and you see that uh, this is in the old mice. And even calorie restriction doesn't seem to help with, uh, uh, with systolic function. Here is an example of hyperthyroid, uh, hyperthyroid mouse. So with hyper, uh, excessive thyroid uh, hormone, you would get uh, increased contractility and that is shown in the higher um, flow velocities. Uh, if untreated, this would eventually uh, push the heart into um, severe hypertrophy and uh, lead to early heart failure. This is a one-year-old cis2 mouse, which is uh, it's got excessive uh, insulin growth factor one, and its contractility is also very high to begin with initially as. Uh, similar to hyperthyroid and this is at one year it comes back normal if you would if you will but by then the heart, uh, heart has hypertrophied so much that it is almost going to failure. Um, uh, next we move on to the little dwarf mice. These mice have diminished systolic function to begin with but they tend to remain the same throughout their lifespan. Uh, in fact, dwarf mice live uh, longer than the wild type mice. This is a special case on the last one, naked mole rats. These guys live up to 30 years and they actually have very diminished systolic function. But it's surprising to see that this is at two years of age and at 24 years of age, the numbers are very similar. So this is how we can use this to compare. Now 
it's not limited just to peak velocity. There are several other parameters, timing of ejection times and other things that you can measure uh, in the systolic function and uh, compare um, uh, groups of mice or across uh, uh, the studies. Um, here is the mitral signal. And um, so this time we orient the probe so that we are capturing mainly the mitral flow signal and we are looking at this uh, portion of the heart. And you can see nice early flow and then started with the atrial peak and you can see the timing with the P waveform. We get a little bit of the aortic flow here and it's actually useful in that because it gives us a way to measure the timing of the isovolumic contraction and the relaxation times. Uh, these contraction and relaxation times are used to find out um, uh, are used in tie index, uh, uh, another parameter that is used to determine the um, cardiac function. But the focus will be on the early flow and atrial flow. Again, you can see here there are several mice that I had shown, several strains of mice, where you have early flow and atrial flow. Individually, uh, uh, we, we can see the differences, but the key one is E to A ratio, and this is what is looked at for seeing how well the heart relaxes. So if the heart is hypertrophied, you would expect that to be diminished. So as you can see in the young mice and in the, uh, the hyperthyroid mice, the E to A ratio is very high, showing that the heart initially relaxes quite well. Uh, in the old mouse, it's diminished, but then surprisingly with the calorie restriction, systolic function did not improve, but diastolic function improves significantly from baseline, from, uh, baseline values. Um, if you look at the cis2 mouse, systolic function didn't diminish that much, but now looking at the diastolic function, it's, uh, it's diminished. And that tells you that the heart is severely hypertrophied and is not relaxing very well. With the little dwarf mice, they begin with diminished relaxation, but that doesn't seem to bother because this stays very stable throughout its entire lifetime. And same is the case with the naked mole rat. So moving on, we want to look at what happens in myocardial ischemia and reperfusion. Um, we've looked at this. This is the sham. Um, this is peak aortic flow velocity in sham uh, control mice. And uh, here is a two-hour occlusion reperfusion mice with the uh, solid circles. And the triangles are permanent occlusion. And as you can see, um, the uh, one week after the procedure, the uh, um, two-hour occlusion still is lower, but then it starts to come back up at two weeks. And by eight weeks, it's almost close to normal function and improves over time in five, six. And uh, comparatively, the permanent occlusion, um, the, uh, the systolic function is uh, diminished as indicated by uh, poor aortic flow velocity uh, peaks. Uh, here we looked at the peak early filling velocity. And again, similar thing happens with the early peak velocity. Here we didn't show the atrial peak because uh, one of the uh, um, problems with um, early to um, um, early to atrial ratio is that when the heart rates are very high, they both fuse together and it's hard to distinguish the peaks. So in those cases, we can just look at early filling velocity as a function of diastolic, um, as diastolic function. So with that, I will move on to the vascular function. So what can we measure in the vascular part? We can measure from several sites in ascending aorta uh, or aortic arch, carotids, uh, descending aorta, left main, coronary arteries, and further down, and there are others that I didn't mention like femorals, tail, artery, and so on. And uh, as you can see, the anatomy is very similar in shape and structure to that we find in uh, humans. So 
this makes all these measurements make uh, sense to do in mice and so that we can uh, easily do translational studies. So these are the signals that we can obtain at all those locations that I had mentioned earlier. And here is the coronaries, the descending aorta. And if you look at the main aortic, there are subtle differences going from ascending aorta to the arch and descending aorta. But then if you look at the other vessels, left and right carotid arteries are distinct from aorta, renals are distinct, and then coronary is distinct. So you can recognize by the shapes of these uh, vessels shapes of the waveforms in these vessels. So what can we uh, use these for? One of the key measurements is called pulse wave velocity measurement. And what this does is it is an indicator of aortic stiffness. We can, so if the aorta is stiff, we can measure the, the speed of the wave. So not to be confused with the velocity measurements themselves. Blood velocity is different from pulse wave velocity. Pulse wave velocity is the the uh, velocity of the pulse that's ejected out of the heart that moves along the aorta. And we will see that uh, in, in the next few slides. So how do we measure this? Uh, you take the distance between the two aortic sites from where we are measuring the flow and we also measure the transit time of the velocity from one location to the other location and that gives us pulse wave velocity. So let's look at where we measure. In the case of aortic uh, pulse wave velocity, we measure at the arch as one of the signals. And then we move to the next site in the abdominal aorta, and we measure from the abdominal aorta signal. And then we take these two waveforms. With respect to ECG, measure the, the timing of with respect to ECG, and then subtract the timing to get the transit time. So it takes. 12 milliseconds for the waveform to travel from this location to the abdominal location, from arch to abdominal in this particular case. This is called non-simultaneous way of measuring uh, the two, uh, the pulse wave velocity. So we are measuring this first and then we are moving to that location we're measuring. But we can also combine these two signals into one waveform and present it as simultaneous. That means you can present this waveform up here and this one on the lower side so that this pulse is actually the same pulse that appeared in the first side. And so this would lead to less errors in making pulse wave velocity measurements. Now moving on, let's look at some of the data. So in young mice, pulse wave velocity, you would expect that the arteries are not stiffer. And so you would expect low pulse wave velocities. And with age, the vessels start to stiffen up. And then your pulse wave velocities tend to go up. With the disease, in this case, this is APOE mice. And they get a little bit more stiffer. This is in the little dwarf mice. And as I have said, dwarf mice tend to have uh, stiffer arteries. But then this remains the same throughout their lifespan. They tend to behave more like older mice. And uh, same thing with the alpha smooth muscle actin mice. One of the key things with the alpha smooth muscle actin is they are not responsive to vasoactive agents. So their blood pressure doesn't change. Uh, if you give vas vasoconstrictors, it doesn't uh, increase. Naked mole rats, again, the classic case, stays very low and remains like that for the entire 20 to 30 years of its lifetime. This is the special case of matrix gland knockout mice where the arteries are uh, calcified. And so as you can see, the pulse wave velocity in these animals is very high. And compare that to uh, vasoconstrictor uh, phenylephrine uh, um, administered to a wild type mouse increases the pulse wave velocity to a very high number. So we can do comparative studies at baselines or with interventions or across several uh, strains of mice. Um, these values, again, were very similar to those measured in people and other large animals.
So those become useful in translational studies, interpreting uh, for translational studies. Here is uh, an example of data that show the effects of Z-domain. So here, it's this uh, plot shows that pulse wave velocity is independent of the heart rate. So with the zeta bradyne, which is a bradycardic agent, uh, as you type, give it and uh, start from baseline and uh, titrate it to control the heart rate to bring it down. So it goes from 430 to 130, but uh, you look at the pulse wave velocity is relatively unchanged with this change in heart rate. And next one, let's look at some of the anesthetic agents. This is a mixture, is a rodent cocktail mixture, which is a ketamine, xylazine, and aspromazine. Um, the, it drops the heart rate, but again, pulse wave velocity is around 300. Uh, same thing for nambutol. Uh, heart rate is increased a little bit, uh, or is more closer to normal values, but then again, pulse uh, wave velocity is around 300. Same thing with fibromethanol, a little higher heart rate. The only one that seems to increase pulse wave velocity is ketamine, and its heart rate is huge, but there are other effects that cause it uh, pulse wave velocity to go higher. So one needs to be a little bit cautious about the effects of uh, certain uh, anesthetic agents. Here, is an example which take a control mouse around 300 uh, with a heart rate of 440. Uh, give phenylephrine. Uh, heart rate doesn't change much, but again, pulse wave velocity increases as expected. And then with time, as phenylephrine clears, it starts to drop down. So in conclusion of part one, uh, Let's say blood velocity signals uh, can be obtained from um, heart and most of the arteries, and we can get these non-invasively, and that means uh, longitudinal studies are possible, uh, whether it's cardiac systolic function, diastolic function, or even pulse wave velocities. So we can determine pulse wave velocities from two uh, arterial sites, um, either non-simultaneously or simultaneously, depending on the what uh, study you're doing. Um, simultaneous would be much better. You can minimize the errors. Um, again, blood velocity and pulse wave velocity in mice are similar to those measured in humans, both in magnitude and shape, and that's the key. The arterial time constants are scaled to the heart period, such that the wave reflections return to the heart at similar times, and this becomes, again, a key uh, during determin in determining what happens in disease conditions uh, like uh, hypertension or when atrophy. The second part of the presentation with the measurements in the pressure overload model of mouse, also known as the TAC model or banded mouse model. Uh, here we can get baseline and post-surgical measurements of the left and right carotid artery. Here we sh the show what we what I'm showing here are post-surgery, and we uh, uh, we can also uh, uh, get uh, measure flow velocity at the stenosis. Uh, use the peak velocity and use the peak velocity to estimate stenosis. Now, the left and right carotid ratio can be used to determine the severity of the stenosis uh, initially and to monitor its progress as well. So let's move forward to take a look at what, uh, how, uh, how they are useful. So if you're looking at the left and right carotid artery before the placing a band or in case of sham animals, you see that the ratio is close to one. And if you were to place a band that's not as uh, tight, you would see something like this where you don't see as much of a pressure drop across the stenosis. And some, if you see waveforms that look like this and the ratios are very high from left, uh, right to left, then you know that you got a much more tighter band and much more higher pressure gradient across that band. So this becomes very useful in determining whether you have a loose band or a tight band, and if you 
were to summarize some of these data, uh, if you look at just the peak velocity ratios of the carotids, this shows that it's significantly different from the baseline. Um, uh, but when you look at the heart weight to body weight ratio, the heart doesn't hypertrophy as much. So that one, one's got to be careful and uh, this helps us in classifying the tightness of the band that way you avoid any kind of uh, uh, non-significance by combining all the banded mice together to compare against the baseline. And so uh, this is just an indicator uh, how uh, you can use this. And since we are doing this non-invasively, we can monitor it from day one or right after the surgery and then one day later, seven days later, and so on. So moving on, I'm going to talk about coronary blood flow. Um, and coronary blood flows, the coronaries are very small and they are very close to many other vessels like uh, aortic as well as mitral uh, and they move along with the heart. So the vessels in this case are moving, they are going to be, it's going to be harder so, or at least it seems impossible uh, to measure from these coronary vessels because of their size as well as uh, motion. But by placing the probe uh, in, a, in a manipulator and fixing it at a certain location, we can get very nice coronary flow signals. And so here is the systolic part of it where there is minimal or no flow and then you got the diastolic when coronaries get perfused. Uh, during the diastolic phase. And so how can we use this? Coronary flow, just measuring coronary flow will not tell us much. What we need to do is how much capacity coronaries have in order to accommodate high stress situations or any need uh, situations. So in mice, uh, isoflurane actually is a a potent vasodilator of the coronaries. So we use that by play, uh, lowering the isoflurane dosage to 1.0, we get a very low coronary flow and as soon as we uh, increase isoflurane uh, to 2.5, uh, coronaries tend to vasodilate and we get a ratio of uh, baseline to hyperemic or hyperemic to base baseline ratio as 4.2. So this number is very similar to what we see in humans. Uh, up to uh, five uh, coronary flow reserve of five in normal um, uh, uh, normal people. So how, let's look at some of the data from different mice or mice at different ages. So this is a six-week mouse. So hyper, uh, this is the coronary flow reserve. Um, and in a three-month mouse and a two-year-old mouse and then a two-year-old mouse with the disease. So as you can see that with, uh, a two-year-old mouse with disease, the flow reserve starts to drop. Now this is not a severe case of the disease, perhaps in these animals, but then I'll show you an example where what happens with the severity of the case. And this is where we combine both the TAC model that I described earlier and coronary model. At baseline, we get nice uh, 2.4 uh, flow reserve. And one day after banding, that flow reserve drops to 1.7. And you can see that there's a significant increase in systolic flow. Uh, but, and if you look at 21 days later, the coronary flow is pretty much systolic and diastolic or one-to-one -one ratio and nothing changes. In fact, the reserve drops below one. That means the coronaries are completely, the reserve is completely uh, used up in these mice. So we can use this to study various uh, uh, disease models of uh, cardiac function. Um, and if you see with the uh, TAC banding, uh, I, as the pressure gradient, this is before banding, and as the pressure gradient uh, uh, across the stenosis increases, coronary flow reserve starts to drop. 
uh, uh, by 21 days of uh, a um, day, days later uh, post surgery. This is the last application I wanted to show. Um, uh, here we can also use the Doppler signal, um, the Doppler probe. In this case, it's not the probe that I've shown. Like uh, 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 this is a cuff probe that we can put on the tail, and this is a pressure cuff. And using this, we can uh, measure blood uh, blood uh, pressure. And as the pressure in the cuff drops, uh, we validated this with uh, simultaneous uh, invasive pressure. And as you can see that uh, as we uh, the pressure in the cuff tail cuff drops, the flow starts to appear right where it starts to appear. We call it systolic, um, and where it gets continuous, it's called the diastolic. So this this has been validated and published uh, by us uh, a few years ago. So for those uh, who have the system, this is another added option to be used. With that. I would like to uh, conclude. Aortic banding or TAC causes significant alterations both in aortic or carotid hemodynamics. Um, the severity of banding can be determined by measuring left and right carotid artery velocities, getting the ratios, uh, and looking at whether the band is uh, tight or uh, uh, you know or loose, and classifying them accordingly. We can also measure pulsatility and resistivity indices to understand the response of the vascular system. And the stenotic jet velocities can be measured. Uh, and uh, we can use the peak jet velocity to estimate the pressure gradient across the band. The second part is the coronary velocities. We can measure that non-invasively. And keeping the probe in place without changing its position and by increasing the isoflurane to, uh, from one to two and a half, we can get a hyperemic response and using that to estimate coronary reserve. Uh, without uh, coronary artery disease, the hyperemic velocity is consistent, but baseline velocity can be uh, a function of age, anesthesia, and cardiac work uh, also. So one has to be careful. Uh, about those. Um, the reserve is progressively, the coronary reserve is progressively reduced after banding. And as you saw in the previous slides, uh, cardiac work increases and the heart hypertrophies and remodels and therefore becoming decompensated and eventually failing. Most of the signals and parameters measured in mice are altered by age and disease in ways very similar to that in humans. So with that, I'd like to summarize uh, the pulse Doppler system capabilities. It's a non-invasive system, allows for longitudinal studies. Uh, we can be measured at various locations on the arterial system uh, and cardiac uh, function as well. Shapes of the waveforms are very distinct, so they can be recognized uh, easily as you're measuring. Uh, signals from two sides can be combined and to get pulse wave velocities. It's possible to achieve small angles and keep the errors in estimating velocity to a minimum. Uh, and the signal acquisition times are short. And the following functions um, can be estimated once a cardiac function or myocardial perfusion through coronary flow reserve or pressure overloads by stenosis um, or we can study aortic stiffness and also look at uh, peripheral perfusion uh, in many models of mice or other small animals. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, my uh, collaborators at Baylor and uh, the other institutes. And uh, I thank you for your participation. And I will now answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anil, um, for that excellent presentation. Um, we have had lots of questions come in, and uh, we have about 10 minutes uh, before the end of our session. So uh, let's dive right into our Q&A session. OK, so uh, we've had a few questions come in about uh, the, this particular topic. Uh, 
uh, namely, how does one make the measurements without knowing you know, anatomically where you're measuring from? And part two of that question, I suppose, is how do you know that you are measuring you know, from, a, from a particular artery or aortic location? Uh, it, uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, that's uh, an important question uh, uh, because uh, that's a lot of people do have that question, and uh, it's uh, uh, it's hard to imagine without having an image how to find where. It, one of the things is, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, is the knowledge having knowledge of the anatomy, and a lot of times when um, someone is trying to learn this, they come to me and want to learn this procedure. I tell them that you need to know your anatomy and then know where to play, place the probe and also practice. So usually when people come learn with me, they're usually within one hour, they're starting to get pretty good uh, signals. Of course, you know, people might say there's a big nurse luck, but uh, that's not true. Most of the time they get it right away and then with practice over the next two weeks, once they go back to the, their labs and practice it, uh, you should be able to get a very good hold on that. The second thing is how do you know where, what vessel you are measuring is the shape of the waveforms. That's the key. You need to know the shape of the waveforms and the timing. And so that will be also a learned thing over a, a couple of weeks time and uh, uh, and for some of the measurements it like for example pulse wave velocities if you are just mainly focused on pulse wave velocities the peak of the velocities are not very important the timing is important so again um, there are kind of compromises where you can go back and forth but without imaging it's uh, you need to know where to place the probe, and that's usually offered during the training um, time. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Perfect. I, I think it would. And you, you mentioned that every uh, pulse wave velocity profile has sort of a distinct um, profile. Um, is that true also in a normal versus diseased state? Does it maintain a distinct profile? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of the, uh, for example, uh, if you're looking at uh, uh, aortic outflow, for example, uh, what you would see is the peaks diminish, go higher or lower, or the timing, the ejection time increase, uh, depending on. Then you may, in some cases where there is the valve dysfunction, you may see some regurgitation, and that will show up in the waveform as well. Um, and uh, so you can d distinguish, but the sh basic shape of the waveform doesn't severely alter. The, what you will see is that diminished in the peak or some other extension of the time. Um, hope that that answers the question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you, you had mentioned uh, in your previous response that uh, you know one needs to know their anatomy uh, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Shuang, specifically at Yale, has asked, you know, about anatomical landmarks uh, for the probe when you're trying to measure from different locations of the a aorta. Can you comment on that? I assume there are specific landmarks. Yeah, uh, for making cardiac measurements, you would go from uh, just below the Z point, and uh, that what that does is uh, um, it gives you the distance about a centimeter. Uh, to where the aortic out, uh, um, outlet is, um, aortic valves, and then the mitral. If you go from the zero, that's for the cardiac. For the, uh, as I had shown in the picture uh, uh, of the uh, vessels, carotids, you go from, uh, come in from the head towards uh, the uh, aorta, so it's almost uh, your uh, parallel to the body of the animal. Um, uh, the longi longitudinal axis, if you will. Uh, to measure from the arch, you would go perpendicular to the body of the animal, um, you know, just above the heart location. Um, and 
Sliding a little below that, you would see the coronaries, and again, you are perpendicular. The probe is perpendicular to the body, aiming towards the heart, um, and you can get the coronary flows. Uh, femorals, again, uh, you would go further down in the abdominal, same thing, again, uh, uh, from uh, the belly area, you, you hold the probe. You can either hand hold it or put it in a uh, uh, per micro positioner and get those signals. Uh, typically, I would say most signals I would handhold because you would get signals faster and you have better control over getting those signals because of fine adjustments that you can make with your hand, which are not easy to make with the micro positioner. But um, uh, and so from many of these locations, you can orient the probe as to, uh, as low as possible so that the angle that at which the beam is intercepting the flow is very low, um, preferably below 15. Uh, for some cases where we are measuring from the left and right carotid, if the angle, if you maintain the angle from the left to right, because you're getting ratios, it doesn't matter uh, if you, uh, you don't need to angle, do angle correction because it's a ratio and it cancels out. So, Hope that answers the okay. question. I, I think so. And again, um, you know, to everyone who's submitting questions, because there are lots of them, we will um, answer them in more detail uh, if we haven't sufficiently, and there'll be opportunities to communicate privately with uh, Anil if necessary. Anil, we have had lots of questions come in about the pulse wave velocity measurement, specifically how one determines the distance between the two probes. Um, can you comment about, you know, how to go about doing that and how to accurately and repeatedly determine the Definitely. dimensions? Definitely. Uh, one of the key things that uh, uh, we do is we definitely know, if, given the, the if, if the audience remembers the picture that I showed for pulse wave velocity measurements at the arch in the abdominal, um, definitely somebody will question, you know, there is a curve, how do you determine that. What we do is get a straight line measurement from point that we measure up in the arch to the point we measure in the abdominal aorta. And we get a straight line distance between the two points. Now, uh, you got to be, uh, for a given operator, you got to be consistently uh, doing the measurements with a certain angle. In the arch, you're almost parallel to the um, uh, arch, so you have uh, uh, you you can get that signal, and then in the abdominal you can get the signal. But the distance that you are measuring from those two points is the key. So first time you measure, you may have four centimeters. Second time you measure, you may have three and a half centimeters. The key is to measure that distance consistently. The curved part of it is always there in the measurement, so it's factored in. Uh, for the correction. So uh, my take on that is that if you continuously measure, uh, if you do that consistently, that curve part of it is going to factor into the um, value of the pulse wave velocity. There are other ways to do it. Now if you're doing two segments simultaneously and with a uh, fixed distance, for example, uh, we also can do this in the ascending aorta uh, going to the carotid artery. And those distances are almost straight. And if people are concerned about that curve, they can go from ascending aorta into carotid artery. That gives them a smaller segment, but you at least get a straight uh, segment, more straight segment there to measure your pulse wave velocities. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Um, all right, so hopefully that satisfies um, you know, everyone that has asked about that uh, particular issue. So uh, Anil, 40% of our audience responded um, to a, one of our, our polling questions saying that they do use larger animals in their research. Mm -hmm. How is it possible to use this device in pigs and how would they go about doing that? What needs to change? Yeah, w one of the things when it gets to larger animals, the uh, the question switches um, or the situation changes from a 
um, non-invasive to sort of invasive uh, where uh, we have cuff probes similar to the ones for transonic flow, for example. But the cuffs go extravascular. You implant them and uh, tunnel the wires out. And then you attach the Doppler probes and you can monitor them. And we have done this in dogs uh, um, uh, several years ago uh, when we had a dog lab uh, where you would put probes at several, implant them and leave them in and the wires come out and then uh, uh, when we want to monitor them then you would attach them to the system uh, and uh, collect the signals. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why I'm saying because these are high frequency probes, you cannot put them on the surface and do non-invasive measurements because they don't go deep enough. So if you were to do large animals, then you would have to go for clinical echocardiograph. The, the cheaper solution is to put flow probes uh, or flow velocity, uh, you know, uh, cuff probes on this and then you can get the velocity numbers uh, or the waveforms. Okay. Um, Thomas at Case Western Reserve University has asked, um, you know, what are the sampling rates, uh, I guess temporal, you know, sampling rates for the waveforms and, um, you know, is there anything that one needs to consider when it comes to data storage about setting sampling rates, uh, recording yeah, sure. time, things like that? Um, in, in the case of small animals, we, we, uh, the Doppler system actually, we sample at a very high rate. We sample each uh, of the audio signals at 125 uh, kilohertz. So that's 125,000 samples per second on each of these channels. So uh, it becomes, uh, uh, in mice, we typically save about two seconds worth of data and that gives us enough uh, cardiac cycles to get an average number. And uh, the size of the file that we save is about a megabyte. So, you know, you, we have saved over the years a lot of data and we, we back it up, of course. But uh, with computers today, I don't think that's a major issue. Unless you want to continuously sample a larger you know, get uh, like a monitor over a period of time. Typically what we do is when we give a, a particular intervention, we do it at intervals. So you give an intervention, we collect a sample before, we collect a sample uh, 10 seconds or uh, 30 seconds, one minute later and so on. And you save that sample and uh, you get intermittent the, the transition points or uh, as uh, the drug uh, effects uh, uh, or drug starts to affect or um, wash out as it washes out. Yeah, so. Okay. Perfect. Um, let's ask one more question. Um, this seems like a fairly challenging application, but I guess maybe it um, sort of gets down to the, the, the nitty-gritty details of the capabilities of a system like this. Um, uh, Dr. Zhuang asks if you can measure right coronary artery, left coronary artery, and left circumflex flow in the same mouse. Uh, right now we can measure from left main uh, because that's uh, where uh, we, we are very sure because the vessel comes straight at the probe as we are placing. Um, we haven't measured from circumflex or the right coronary artery. Now, I can. Uh, one of the things that uh, we are currently pursuing is looking at right coronary flow and to make uh, that measurement. Uh, that's in the works, but right at present we can only measure from left main. Um, okay. 